Good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? I got the mic on? Okay, good deal. Um, if you're in the morning service, I was giving the announcements, and uh, right before I said the words to prepare for worship, I realized I had forgotten an announcement, which is why I paused so long. Uh, I was thinking to myself, should I say this last announcement? So it was hopefully a time to prepare for worship, but it was also me trying to remember uh, all the announcements and whether I should deliver them to you. I, this is what I forgot. We're having no Sunday school class next week. Uh, Sunday after Thanksgiving is a little bit unusual, so uh, please keep that in mind. Figure it's safe to tell you that announcement here because you're the ones who come. <laughs> okay, hopefully you have a handout that you got on the way in, and let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for uh, the pleasure and privilege of gathering together as your people. Thank you for the bond that we share in union with Christ, crucified and raised. Thank you for the ministry of the word that applies to us spiritually and mysteriously the very power of Christ's death and resurrection. Uh, thank you for reminding us who we are before your face and who you call us to be in your beloved Son. We pray that as we attend to the material that is before us in this class, that we would grow into the image of Christ, that we would know that your word is true, that we would entrust ourselves to you, and that you might receive all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a little straw poll, informal poll for the class today. It actually relates to the lesson we're going to be talking about. I'm curious to know how many of you think it should be illegal to put up Christmas decorations before Thanksgiving. <laughs> Show of hands, okay, Arnie, Perry, okay. Now, who has put up Christmas decorations before Thanksgiving? Okay, we got one in the back, very good. Okay, seek peace and pursue it, like we heard <laughs> this morning. Um, my boys and I went on a bike ride yesterday and went down to a house that, um, that is just outlandish in its Christmas decorations. And the house next door is, is for sale, and it's not doing it any favors with this <laughs> gigantic Christmas. Okay, here's how it relates to <laughs> the lesson this morning. Uh, we've been talking about the privilege of union with Christ. Uh, we've spent two weeks now talking about um, how our union with Christ is rooted in the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, uh, as the Spirit works to save a people to the Lord, and yet it is the Holy Spirit who is climactically poured out by the risen Christ on the day of Pentecost. And all of the saving activity of the Spirit in the Old Testament is actually contingent upon Christ's coming, His obedience, His death, His resurrection, His entrance into glory, and his full reception and possession of the Holy Spirit as the reward for his work. You remember that at the day of Pentecost, Christ then turns and pours out this reward, the gift of the Holy Spirit upon the church, and it is Christ's Spirit who unites people to Christ and brings them into saving faith. We're going to look more closely at how this happens uh, this morning. But union with Christ is the great privilege that we've been discussing. But union with Christ, and here's how it relates to Christmas, is a gift that keeps on giving. It is a privilege that brings other privileges with it. And so in the coming weeks, I want to look with you at some of the privileges, or to use classic Reformed language, the language of our confession, the benefits of our union with Christ. We've talked about what union is. I want to talk in the weeks to come about the benefits that come to us in union with Christ. Okay, before we do that though, I want to look with you at union one more time as a child might look at a Christmas package. Maybe you've seen this. Maybe you did this. You get a package. What do you do with it? What does a child do with it? Shakes it around, 
looks around, twists it around, inspects the packaging, tries to anticipate what it all means for him or for her. Of course, our union with Christ is not a package to hold. Our union brings us face to face with a Savior to behold and to worship. But I want to look with you at what comes before and after, logically speaking, uh, our union with Christ. How does union fit into what God does when he converts a sinner to himself? So I want to kind of expand our gaze a little bit and understand the place of union as the scriptures speak about it in the whole complex of conversion. This is going to give us a better picture of what it means to be saved, and then we'll be in a good position to, in coming weeks, up until Christmas, look at the benefits of our union with Christ. So the title on your handout is a bit of a misnomer. We're going to be getting to the benefits of our union with Christ uh, just a bit, but we're going to dive into those benefits in weeks to come. Okay, review here. By way of introduction, we've said that union with Christ is spiritual, mystical, unbreakable, full, and free. We can't spend a ton of time on this. We've already done this, but spiritual. I said that that our union with Christ is spiritual with a capital S. Anybody remember? In what sense is it spiritual? It is wrought by the Holy Spirit. Very good. Spiritual with a capital S, meaning we're dealing here with the ministry of the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit who unites us to Christ. I already said about Christ's reception and gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. It's mystical. Mystical. Okay, we as Presbyterians are reclaiming this word in our tradition. Uh, Mystical, related to the word mystery. And we talked about how Paul first speaks of the mystery of Christ as God's eternal plan of salvation that's being progressively unfolded in history. And that plan gets climactically revealed when Christ actually arrives on the scene of history and dies and rises again. Uh, Paul is privileged as an apostle to proclaim the gospel of the mystery of Christ, a mystery that involves the union of Jews and Gentiles into Christ. Everything that was foreshadowed in the Old Testament has now been thrown open in the New. Paul says this is the mystery of God revealed. Our union with Christ is rooted in the revelation and execution of this eternal plan of God. But it's also a mystery, it's mystical, in the sense that our union transcends our human ability and even our comprehension. It's a supernatural work of God. It's something that that is difficult to put into words, though we use all the words that Scripture gives us. It's unbreakable, thirdly. Uh, It's unbreakable because uh, it's rooted in an eternal determination of God that the Scriptures speak of as a kind of union before time began. Okay, we didn't tease this out as much as perhaps we should have, but but our election in Christ, the people of God known before the foundation of the world, loved before the foundation of the world, God contemplates them in light of the plan of salvation in Christ. This is not a saving union, but it is a kind of union. We have been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And as we arrive, as we're born, as we live our lives, before we come to know Christ, though that eternal union is true, we still live outside of Christ until God converts our hearts. We're still under his wrath and curse until we're brought into union with Christ. But that union is unbreakable. It's rooted in eternity past, and it will continue into eternity future. When we are brought into saving union with Christ, that is something that never breaks. Uh, It's as unbreakable as the body of Christ risen from the dead because he is the one to whom we are united. It is full. It's full. Every saving blessing we have from Christ comes to us in Christ. And when we get to the benefits of our union with Christ, particularly justification and sanctification, 
we're going to distinguish and relate these benefits. But, but understand now that both of them come in union with Christ. We're not only uh, justified and have a righteous standing before God, but he begins to renew our hearts. He begins to change us on the inside as well. And it's free. Uh, we don't need to be qualified for it. We don't have to have the right credentials for it. Uh, there's nothing that we can do to prepare ourselves for it. A union with Christ is something that, that God does unilaterally as a gift in our salvation. And we talked about that hymn, Come ye sinners, poor and wretched, uh, weak and wounded, sick and sore. There's a verse that says, Let not conscience let you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. And I said I had a little bit of a problem with that verse. Uh, because it seems to indicate that we must feel some kind of conviction. We must ready ourselves for Christ before we're united to him. But then the, the hymn writer actually solves the problem. All the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. This he gives you. This he gives you. Tis the Spirit's glimmering beam. Before, before God unites someone to Christ, they don't know conviction of sin. They, they're living as if they don't have a problem. Or if they have a problem, they don't want Christ as the solution. Uh, this is the state of our souls outside of Christ. All the conviction of sin that we feel is a function of Christ's grace to us as he comes and grabs hold of us and brings us to himself. Okay, Westminster Larger Catechism uh, 66. You should, you should be able to nod your head and say, yes, I understand every part of this answer. What is that union which the elect have with Christ? Answer, the union which the elect have with Christ is the work of God's grace whereby they are spiritually, maybe a capital S would be better, spiritually and mystically, yet really and inseparably joined to Christ as their head and husband, which is done in their effectual calling. Now we've looked at just about every phrase in this question of the larger catechism. We've even talked about effectual calling, but we haven't given it the attention that it deserves. So we're taking our Christmas package and we're looking around at it and we want to understand how does effectual calling relate to union with Christ? Effectual calling. This is the invisible, sovereign, irresistible call of God unto salvation. Effectual calling is what happens when God converts a sinner to himself. Um, for those of you who are rock-ribbed, five-point Calvinists, let me just say, may your tribe increase. Uh, effectual calling would be under the banner of the I, irresistible grace, in the acronym TULIP. Okay, irresistible grace. God's irresistible grace hits a sinner in his or her effectual calling, and it inevitably, inexorably, uh, converts the sinner. Let's look a little more closely at this idea of effectual calling in its relationship to union. Okay, this is what we want to think about. Effectual calling and union with Christ. And I want to look at two key verses from the New Testament. Um... Number one, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, notice there is the word called there. But when reading 1 Corinthians 1, 9, we need to distinguish this call from what we could call the general call of the gospel the general call of the gospel if you want a verse that speaks to the general call you can look at acts 17 
30 and 31. Why don't we read that verse together? Acts 17, if you have your Bible, verse 30 and 31. This is Peter addressing the Areopagus. And uh, he's talking to Gentiles. He speaks of God being creator of all. He doesn't live in a temple made by human hands, for he himself gives life and breath to everything. And he says this in verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Okay, particularly in verse 30. He now commands all people everywhere to repent. That's the general call. What, what Aaron Messner does from the pulpit is the general call. Um, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. That's the general call. The gospel is for every man, woman, boy and girl. The general call is universal. It is indiscriminate. However, the effectual call is something different. The effectual call is not universal. The effectual call is not indiscriminate. It is particular and it is discriminating. The fact that the effectual call is particular and discriminating does not negate the universal indiscriminate character of the general call. It is a real call. It obligates people everywhere at all times to repent and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a fake invitation. But when we speak of the effectual call, we're simply recognizing that we need a supernatural work of God if anyone is going to respond to the general call. And that effectual call is precisely what Paul is speaking of here in verse 9. Let's look again at this verse. Three observations I want to make about verse 9 here. First, who is the active agent in the effectual call? According to verse 9. It is God. Okay. When speaking of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can we be any more specific about which person might be in view here in verse 9? Which person of the Godhead might Paul have in mind in verse 9 who issues the effectual call? The Father. Notice God here is distinguished from His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that it says His Son indicates that at least here, the word God is being identified with the Father. And that sometimes happens in the Bible. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are each God and fully God. But oftentimes, the Bible uses the word God solely to, return, uh, uh, to uh, apply to the Father. Other times, God has the whole, the all, all persons in view. Sometimes the distinct persons aren't even front and center, and it's just talking about the one, the one true God. But here, God here is God the Father. He is faithful. And f- the Father is the agent who issues the effectual call. Second, let me ask you this question. What does the human person do in the effectual call according to this passage. What, what, do, what, do, what do you do according to verse 9 in your effectual calling? Nothing. I heard nothing over here. Ronnie, thank you. Nothing. You do nothing in your effectual calling. Notice, if you were to be really uh, linguistic about this, The word called there is is what's known as the passive voice. The passive voice, you English majors. You were called. Sometimes um, when I'm reading a a commentary on a particular passage and comes across a verb that's in the passive voice, sometimes commentators will speak of it as 
the divine passive, the divine passage, because the implicit agent of the verb is God doing something to people. And that's true in this case. We have a divine passive, passive here. God is faithful by whom you were called. This is underscoring the unilateral character of the call. God doesn't call you even on the basis of anything foreseen in you. Uh, we might be tempted to think, well, I'm not doing anything in, the, in, in being effectually called, but God, God knows what he's getting. Uh, that's not the case. It is by sheer grace. God doesn't look down the corridors of time and see the good works that you were going to do. He doesn't see how smart you are or how attractive you are. All these things may be true of everyone in this room, but this is not why God calls you. He calls you out of his grace because of his love to reveal his goodness to you. And notice, especially third, the immediate result of the call is union with Christ. Described here in terms of fellowship with Christ. The Father calls, we do nothing, and He brings us into union with Christ. Let's remember this wonderful quote from John Calvin. I'll read it again. First, we must understand that as long as Christ remains outside of us and we are separated from Him, all that he has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value for us. We also, in turn, are said to be engrafted into him and to put on Christ. For as I have said, all that he possesses is nothing to us until we grow into one body with him. It is true that we obtain this by faith, Yet reason itself teaches us to climb higher and to examine into the secret energy of the Spirit by which we come to enjoy Christ and all his benefits. To sum up, the Holy Spirit is the bond by which Christ effectually unites us to himself. Okay, there's a lot in this passage. But notice how in 1 Corinthians 1.9, the agent here is the Father... Calvin says, yes, the Father works, the Son also works. In that final line, Christ effectually unites us to himself. Strictly speaking, I think it's better to say it's the Father, but certainly Christ is involved here. He's calling people to himself. He's issuing the Spirit. But that's the point I want to drive home. It is the Spirit who is at work in our effectual calling. The Father issues the call, and the Spirit is unites us to Christ. The Father issues the call and the Spirit unites us to Christ. This is a Trinitarian act, our union with Christ. Okay. The Father calls into Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. But notice in Calvin's quote, he says, it is true that we obtain this by faith. So I want to ask a second question here. How does faith relate to this complex of events? We've seen effectual calling is what brings us into union. What does faith do? Well, let's look at Ephesians 2. 4 through 8. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay, I've got a few observations of this text that I want to walk through with you. Number one, let's look at verse, four, uh, verse 
1 and 2. We learn just why that passive voice is used in verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 1. The passive voice is used, we do nothing in our effectual calling because of the truth of Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. It's because outside of Christ, the text says we're dead. Uh, We are spiritually dead to the things of God. And dead people don't do anything in the realm of this world. Notice, while we were dead, verse 4 comes along and says, we were made alive. Because of the great love with which he loved us, dead sinners, spiritually dead people, are made alive. Now let me just pause right here and tell you that oftentimes the concept, the reality of regeneration, being made alive, being born again in the heart, is very closely associated with effectual calling. In our effectual calling, when when God sends the Holy Spirit to work on the heart of a sinner, It's that effectual calling that brings someone alive. Our confession of faith, the Westminster Confession of Faith, has a chapter on effectual calling, but it includes in that chapter regeneration. It doesn't have a separate chapter on regeneration, on being made alive. So just keep in mind that these two things are very closely related. We saw calling in 1 Corinthians 1.9. We're seeing regeneration in Ephesians 2.5. But notice when we are born again, when our heart is made alive, it is made alive, notice in verse 5, with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Notice all of the language of union with Christ in this passage. We are made alive with Christ, and we could say in Christ. So the main point we should get from Ephesians 2, 5 and 6 is this. Regeneration is what happens when God effectually calls someone into union with Christ. Regeneration is what happens when God effectually calls someone into union with Christ. Regeneration, we could speak of it, is the first moment of our spirit-wrought union with Christ. So far, the emphasis in verses 4 through 7 is again on the unilateral work of God. Notice verse 4, He loved us with a rich mercy. When we were dead in sin, we were made alive with Christ, verse 5. And in this regenerating act, we are raised and seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Verse 7 gives us the great purpose of this, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ. And then, and only then, does Paul move to what we do. Or better yet, what God enables us to do on our side of the equation. He says in verse 8 that we have been saved through faith. But even when Paul mentions faith, he is at pains to tell us that this faith is itself a gift of God so that no one can boast. This is a gift that comes to us from Christ And I think it's fair to say it's a gift that comes to us in Christ. So putting 1 Corinthians 1, 9 together with Ephesians 2, here's the picture that begins to emerge as we try to synthesize these texts. Through the Word, okay, these texts, I haven't talked about this explicitly, but we could go to other texts. A key one is uh, 1 Peter 1. Uh, 123, 
You have been saved by the imperishable Word of God. You've been born again through the Word. Through the Word, God makes us alive in our effectual calling by which we are united to Christ. And the immediate reflex of our union with Christ is the Spirit-enabled exercise of faith. Christ comes to a sinner He lays hold on you by the power of the Holy Spirit at the Father's direction and the immediate response of your soul having been made alive is to lay hold on Christ by faith. This is the picture that's emerging from these texts and I have a summary here to sum up so far on our handout. Effectual calling by the Father causes union with Christ. And the attendant human response to our union with Christ is faith and repentance. So we could say, when we're speaking about union, from God's side, the Holy Spirit comes to us, makes us alive in our union with Christ. From from our side, it's faith and repentance that lays hold on Christ. But the latter only happens because the former has happened. Any questions, comments about this so far? We want to we understand exactly how all this transpires. And let me just say, friends, the reason we want to understand this is not only because the Bible teaches it, but because it magnifies the grace of God in our salvation. This is how he saves sinners. It's how he saved you. And even though as we're really piecing apart these texts and we're looking at Ephesians 2 and we're seeing regeneration and the response of faith and union with Christ in our effectual calling, we want to understand that this wonderful work of God brings us into a vital, living fellowship with Jesus. And for that reason, I included this quote from John Preston when he's talking about our union. And he says, There is a union made between Christ and us when he comes into the heart, when he dwells in us and we in him, when Christ is so brought into our hearts that he lives there, and when we are so united to him that we live in him, when he grows in us as the vine in the branches and we grow in him as the branches in the vine. When faith has done this, we could equally say when the Spirit has done this, right? then it is an effectual faith when it knits and unites us to Christ. This doctrine is not a sterile doctrine. It's not a cold doctrine. This is the very lifeblood of our salvation. This is the summary of the whole Christian life. This vital, dynamic union with Christ. And to drive this point home, I want to move to the third thing on our handout, which is communion with Christ. And here's my thesis for this third section. Union with Christ brings communion in its wake. Union with Christ brings communion in its wake. Uh, I had the privilege yesterday of doing a wedding uh, it was my first Atlanta wedding. It wasn't, it wasn't a couple from here. It was my wife's cousin. Uh, they had a COVID wedding in a backyard with just a very small group of people. Um, it was a wonderful memory. As soon as like five minutes into the service, there was like a yard, yard work going on in the house across the street. And we just heard, I mean, right when I got into my homily. <laughs> and before the vows, I, I said, Blocking out all other noises. Repeat after me when you take your vows. But they were good sports about it all. But that, that wedding forged a union, a covenant union. And one of the things I was exhorting them to was the way they were going to relate to one another in communion with one another, in the wake of their union. How are they going to love one another? Uh, how are they going to look to Christ as they loved one another? Uh, union brings communion with it and it is communion here that's going to set up our look at the benefits of our union with Christ so let's look at Westminster larger catechism 69 which asks about communion 
Uh, what was it? 66 asked about union. 69, communion. What is the communion in grace which the members of the invisible church have with Christ? Answer. The communion in grace which the members of the invisible church have with Christ is their partaking of the virtue of his mediation in their justification, adoption, sanctification, and whatever else in this life manifests their union with him. Isn't that an interesting phrase? Before we get to that phrase, let me just say a quick word about this line, partaking of the virtue of his mediation. The virtue of his mediation. This is an older use of the word virtue. We're not just talking about moral qualities here. The virtue of his mediation could be rephrased the power of his mediation. The efficacy of his mediation. All that he now embodies as endowed by the Spirit of heaven. That is the power of his mediatorial work to reconcile sinners to God. The very power of that reconciliation comes to us in our union with him. We are united to a person. And that person is endowed with saving power. Um, Okay, I'm going to give you this illustration. I ran it by my wife. She said, don't use it in a sermon, but she thought it would be okay for Sunday school. Uh, when I was younger, we'd go to the mall occasionally, and there was a store called Sharper Image. Do you remember Sharper Image? I thought it was the coolest store in the world. Outlandishly priced electronics kind of get gimmicks, and gimmicks and gadgets, like a, like a floating globe or something, stuff you would never really need. There were two things in Sharper Image that I always wanted to do. Number one, the leather chair that was a massage chair. Okay, Always there was a teenager or uh, a grade school person sitting in that chair. The other one was this, I hope this works, this electric, electric kind of globe with the, um, with the pulsing electrical signals coming out from a little tiny sphere on the inside. And it was just, it was just going all the time. And what did you do with it? put your hand on the side of that glass globe and then all those electrical kind of purple firing things would, would migrate over to your palm. And you wouldn't feel anything. It was just cool to look at. Okay, probably not worth making that illustration. But when we come into contact in our effectual calling and by faith with the living Christ, the power of his person is communicated to us in our communion with him. That is the virtue of his mediation coming to us. And the power and efficacy of his mediation brings into view and applies to us the benefits of justification, adoption, and sanctification. So if we're to um, mark this out on the board, okay, this is going to be small. Union with Christ, justification, adoption, and sanctification are key benefits that we get by the virtue of his mediation in union with him. And notice the text goes on to say, and whatever else in this life manifests their union with him. Well, there's another question and answer, and I believe this is biblical. We're going to look at a few texts at the end here, but it's not on your handout, but question number 36 of the shorter catechism. Question 36 asks this. What are the benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification? There's a whole question of what is this whatever else manifests our union with Christ? If these are the biggies, and we're going to look at the biggies in the weeks to come, what is this etc.? All the other things that flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification. Answer. The benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification are assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, 
joy in the Holy Ghost, increase of grace, and perseverance therein to the end. We could name a hundred other things. But those are some good ones. Assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Ghost, increase of grace, and perseverance therein to the end. We're going to see how these things flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification in union with Christ. But let's remember for today, all of these things manifest our union with Christ. If something manifests your union with Christ, it depends on your union with Christ. Something manifests that which is more basic. And all of these benefits depend on our union with the living Christ. And then on your handout I have here, I say a few uh, scripture texts will make it clear that all saving benefits secured by Christ, benefits that we receive from Christ, come to us insofar as we are in Christ. And just, we can't go through all of them one by one, but just notice what the scriptures say again and again and again. We're elected in Christ. We die and rise with and in Christ when we are converted. One other dimension of our effectual calling, our union with Christ, is that it is viewed in the Bible as a death and a resurrection. We're dead spiritually. We're made alive in Christ. But no sooner are you made alive in Christ, but guess what? You die to yourself. You die to the habits and patterns of this age. You die to your membership in this fallen world. And you're made alive to your citizenship in heaven. Alive to the things of God in a way that wasn't true before. As God progressively works in you to make what is, what is so new become more and more natural to you. What was once so alien to you becomes now something that finds a true home in your heart more and more, even as you fight against sin. We're regenerated in Christ. We're justified in Christ. We're adopted in Christ. We're sanctified in Christ. We persevere in Christ. And then H is our physical death. We die in Christ. Our bodies are still united to Christ until the resurrection. And then finally we're raised and glorified in Christ. So what are we to take from all of this? Well, this is not going to be news to you. Salvation is best understood in terms of spirit-wrought union with Christ in whom we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Number two, and perhaps this is new for you, we ought to think of our salvation as Christ-focused. Our salvation centers on a person. And we ought never think of these benefits of our salvation, justification, adoption, sanctification, in abstraction from the person of Jesus. They are found in Him as the risen Savior. He is the living embodiment of salvation. And it is only when we come into union and communion with Him that these benefits become ours. And so I say, let us see, may we commune with Him, may we reflect on all that is found in Him, May we praise him for his benefits and respond to him uh, with worship. Let me pause before we close in prayer, see if there are any questions or confusion about what we've covered today. Any thoughts, questions, comments about effectual calling, leading to union with the attendant human response of faith, wherein we receive the benefits of communion and all of these benefits and whatever else manifests our union with Him? Okay, I, I, I will take that as a sign that everything is just crystal clear. Thank you for that. Let me close in prayer. Father, we thank You for the way the Scriptures reveal to us so much of of what you do in our salvation. So much is mysterious, so much is uh, beyond our understanding, but Lord, you reveal uh, so much of your goodness and grace. We marvel at the unilateral character of our salvation. Truly, 
Um, Jonah is right. Salvation is of the Lord. Help us, Father, to lift our eyes to Christ as he is revealed to us in the Scriptures. Help us to know true fellowship with him as we remember all that is ours in him. And Father, may we worship you and give ourselves to you and in so doing manifest that we are Christ's and he is ours. Uh, Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.